Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Robin Dhawan, former Chief of the Naval Staff and incumbent Chairman, Society for Aerospace, Maritime and Defense Studies, Admiral Karambir Singh, former Chief of the Naval Staff and Chairman of the National Maritime Foundation, Sri Swami Nathan Gurumurthy, Chairman, Vivekananda International Foundation, Mr. Ashok Nair, Ms. Geeta Nair, members of the family and close friends of the late Admiral K.K. Nair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Vice Admiral K.K. Nair Memorial Lecture 2024. I am Priyasha Dixit, and I will be your host for today's occasion. In common with all other echelons of the NMF, I find myself simultaneously humbled and proud that quite so many of you have made the time and taken the trouble to be here with us today. We gather here to commemorate the NMF's 19th Foundation Day and honor the many contributions of the late Vice Admiral Keval Krishnan Nair, Ati Our Excellence and the Founding Chairman of the National Maritime Foundation. As such, he and his family, represented today by his son, Mr. Ashok Nair, and his daughter, Ms. Geeta Nair, will always have a special place in our individual and collective hearts. We are deeply honored today to have with us Sri Swaminathan Guru Murthy, who has very graciously consented to deliver this year's Vice Admiral K.K. Nair Memorial Lecture. And now, without any further ado, may I request the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, AVSM and Bar, VSM, to offer his introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Priyasha. Admiral uh, R. Hari Kumar, Chief of the Naval Staff, uh, Admiral Robin Dhawan, former Chief of the Naval Staff and incumbent Chairman of the SAMDES and fellow conspirator uh, in the setting up and running of this particular National Maritime Foundation and a close friend of mine, uh, Admiral Karambir Singh, former Chief of the Naval Staff, another very good friend of mine and uh, uh, Colleague, mentor, guide, many things, Sri S. Gurumurthy, Chairman of the Vivekanand International Foundation, and our esteemed speaker for this uh, morning's memorial lecture, Mr. Ashok Nayar and Ms. Geeta Nayar, both of whom stand in uh, solidarity with the NMF as torchbearers of the legacy of the late Admiral K.K. Nayar. Uh, general officers, flag officers, air officers, serving and veteran excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, for those of you who didn't quite catch it, my name is Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan. I am privileged to be the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation and its CEO. And I echo the welcome afforded to all of you by the charming uh, Ms. Priyasha Dixit. And I'm honored by the presence of quite so many luminaries uh, that stud uh, our intellectual firmament. In fact, I think if we were to switch off the lights and actually have this event somewhat in the late evening, we wouldn't need any lights at all because the radiance of your own uh, intellect would prove to the government of India that uh, this business of moving from uh, fossil fuel or any other form of energy to simply intellectual energy would be quite an achievement. Uh, on this day, ladies and gentlemen, we remember with gratitude and pride the enormous contribution of uh, Vice Admiral uh, Gable Kishan Nayar, PVSM, ABSM, whose uh, conviction that India desperately needed a maritime and not merely a naval think tank uh, found resonance not easily but with, con with, with persuasion within the Indian Navy and the Ministry of Defense. And it is not often found that the Ministry of Defense and the Indian Navy gen uh, are willing to to create an organization that they will not thereafter control or um, fetter, but will allow it to sprout wings and to be free and relatively unfettered, looking not at the naval domain, which is already adequately represented within the Navy and within the, maritime, within the Ministry of, uh, of Defense, but at the maritime domain as a whole. My introduction to you uh, stems from the fact that today is our foundation day. It was on this day in the year 2005 that the uh, late and deeply mourned uh, former president of India, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, uh, inaugurated and established the National Maritime Foundation. Um, it is, he, Admiral Nayar was then having convinced the Ministry of Defense, having convinced the um, 
the Indian Navy's hierarchy to create this new structure, which as I said, they would support both financially as well as uh, intellectually and functionally, but not control uh, and allow it to have relatively unfettered uh, movement is something that is uh, worthy of uh, reiteration. Um, another of his uh, of his uh, pet projects was indeed the ORF and most recently the Vivekanand International Foundation, and his uh, Admiral Nair's untimely departure from our midst on the 18th of September of 2018 is something that we we were mortally wounded by, as indeed is the case with the other two think tanks that I've mentioned. And it is therefore entirely in the fitness of things that um, the incumbent chairman of the uh, VIF, Sri uh, Swaminathan Gurumurthy, should be delivering this year's uh, Vice Admiral KK Nair Memorial Lecture. Uh, Sri Gurumurthy needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, he will address, in fact, the rise of civilizational consciousness and civilizational uh, nationalism, which, as he told me a few minutes ago, is not so much a provocative as, a, as, as it is a con contemplative um, theme. And uh, this uh, finds a great deal of resonance with us for because only yesterday, while uh, launching the um, commencement of the 2024 spring internship program at the NMF, which is called an internship program, but actually is a teaching capsule. Uh, I was mentioning to them that we are two languages. This is our because it is our desire that we can speak two in Hindi and 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 Hindi Hindi and idiomatic English. Our अगर पेड़ की तरह उसको माना जाए तो उसका जो तन है उसकी जो तन की जड़ें हैं वो भारतीय इतिहास भारतीय सभ्यता और भारतीय संस्कृति में गड़ी रहनी चाहिए लेकिन उसके जो चहनियां हैं उसके जो फल हैं उसके जो पत्ते हैं उसके जो फूल हैं वो एक अंतरराष्ट्रीय बगीचे में खिलने चाहिए वंस अगेन ठोस मुहावरेदार हिंदी इडियोमैटिक इंग्लिश not khichdi and therefore when we go abroad we go to india we reflect the the degree of excellence that uh, admiral nayar uh, bestowed upon us and for which we are uh, forever going to be grateful now I, a few words about the national maritime foundation whose foundation day it is other people will be talking at different levels i just thought i would uh, introduce some of you to what we do uh, as a track 1.5 institution, which means that we have serving and retired members as well as members from drawn from the civil society and academia. Uh, with a healthy mix of all of this, uh, the NMF has established over the last few years a very strong reputation, uh, both in India and abroad, for the sheer excellence of its research and its advocacy. Like any think tank, we have three mandatory areas, research, which we must do in the first place, and then we must be able to advocate that research and advocacy of research requires a convening platform, so we, we undertake convening. We are conscious of the fact that we also undertake action by way of teaching, not only within NMF, but also at universities and colleges and through the internship programs of which I made uh, earlier mention. Uh, we have a number of areas of uh, research interest, and uh, they can be clubbed into seven major categories, namely holistic maritime security. I cannot emphasize the adjective holistic sufficiently. Uh, secondly is maritime connectivity, maritime resource geopolitics, incorporating national and regional facets of the blue economy and climate change. Fourth is marine and maritime and naval technology. The fifth is public international maritime law. The sixth is maritime safety. The seventh is maritime history, maritime heritage, and maritime culture, which is an area that we will be concentrating upon uh, this morning. We have a vibrant and a popular internship program of which I've already made mention. We run it twice a year. We have two variants of this, three months and six months. We are conscious of the fact that this internship program takes a bunch of interns 
who like everybody else in our country has not had the advantage of having heard the word maritime through their entire scholastic career, moving from kindergarten to a postdoctoral period. We also have a large number of partnerships and, and we undertake a wide gamut of activities, uh, collaborating with the organizations in India and abroad that focus upon the maritime field. Um, we also have some media partners, we have event based uh, partnerships as well, but I want to emphasize that we have as many as 16 uh, national partnerships and over 30 international ones. Um, and those come from a wide range of countries, including Australia, Bangladesh, Bulgaria, China, Israel, Japan, Mexico, the Philippines, Russia, Sri Lanka, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, UK, the USA, and Vietnam. And I want to tell you last thing. Many people have MOUs with many institutions. Many of these MOUs are simply brass plaques on the imaginary or real foyer of some building. We don't have MOUs of that sort. If we have an MOU, we service the MOU. If we don't service the MOU, we allow it to lapse. So last point is with regard to the fellowships and grants through which much of our activities uh, are underwritten and an increasing number of individuals and organizations provide tangible manifestation of their support to the NMF by becoming benefactors. Now we don't have a very large number, but the small number we have are particularly dedicated to the maritime uh, advancement of India. And uh, as I said in the beginning of the, uh, at the opening of the 2023 edition of the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue in November of last year, standing in the vanguard of our small but dedicated list of benefactors is indeed the Nayar family. Uh, ably represented here by Mr. Ashok Nayar and Ms. Uh, Geeta Nayar, the son and daughter respectively of the late Admiral Kabul Kishan Nayar. I wish to publicly thank them uh, for the establishment and sustenance of the Vice Admiral K.K. Nayar Fellowship, which enables the NMF to take on board research scholars of repute, and those are currently working on a cluster that we call C uh, PCRT. So that's Pakistan, China, Russia, and Turkey. Uh, when I say this abroad, they are a bit, uh, they're a bit of surprise that we include Turkey in this, but we currently do. And with the, with, the, with the efforts of these scholars and the benefactors that we have and their support, I'm sure that the NMF will start to churn out better and better quality of maritime research. There are many, we are a national maritime foundation. First of all, we are national. Secondly, there are many national something or the others, and there are many foundations. We are the only national maritime foundation. Maritime is our USP. And we build upon that. And with that and those few words uh, of introduction to the National Maritime Foundation, I enjoin and exhort you to look at our website. It improves by the day. And uh, with those uh, few remarks, let me hand over back to uh, Priyasha to uh, navigate us through the rest of the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Following Admiral Chauhan's remarks, we are honored to have with us Admiral R. Hari Kumar, EVSM, AVSM, VSM, EDC, the Chief of the Naval Staff, who will deliver the inaugural address. His visionary leadership continues to guide our maritime endeavors towards new horizons. I now request the CNS to deliver his inaugural address. Uh, Sri Swaminathan Gurumurthy Ji, Chairman Vivekanta International Foundation, Admiral Karambir Singh, Retired Chairman, uh, Retired Chairman National Maritime Foundation, Vice Admiral D.K. Tripathi, Vice Chief of Naval Staff, former Chief of Navy, Admiral R.K. Dhawan, uh, family members of Admiral K.K. Nayar, Sri Ashok Nayar and Ms. Geeta Nayar, Flag Officers, Retired Flag Officers, Chairman NMSE, Admiral Ashok Kumar, uh, distinguished dignitaries, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to be a part of Vice Admiral K.K. Nayar Memorial Lecture, and it's indeed a pleasure to have 
Sri Gurumurthy amongst us today. I am thankful to him for having taken the time out to speak to us on this occasion. Uh, this lecture is indeed a tribute to the exemplary life of Vice Admiral K.K. Nair, a strategic thinker and visionary as brought out uh, by Admiral Chawan. He's left an indelible mark on not just on the Indian Navy, but on this, on our national strategic uh, domain, as well as the Maritime Foundation. The established in 2005, NMF was obviously the brainchild of the Admiral and he imbued it with a single-minded focus, that of being a bright and enduring beacon, dispelling the maritime myopia which had affected Bharat for so much of our history. So as the nation's first maritime think tank, the NMF has grown rapidly in stature and strength, addressing a myriad of themes and issues that together constitute comprehensive maritime power. Uh, NMF's contribution to national policy making, public awareness and international collaborations are truly commendable. One such endeavor obviously has been the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue, which is an annual apex level international conference co-organized by the Indian Navy. And through this forum, the NMF as the MEA and Navy's knowledge partner curates discussions on critical maritime issues, bringing together key regional stakeholders to examine challenges, explore opportunities, and formulate collaborative solutions, thereby contributing to a safe, secure, and stable uh, Indo-Pacific. So as we navigate the evolving complexities in the region, marked by ongoing conflicts in Europe and Middle East, and the emergence of non-traditional threats, a uh, deeper understanding of the evolving geopolitical dynamics along with associated strategies to counter these challenges become an imperative, making the NMF's role even more critical today. Uh, notably, the NMF collaborated with the Navy to, uh, towards formulating the landmark in Indian Maritime Security Strategy or the IMSS released in 2015. And this document continues to guide the Navy's efforts in protecting, preserving, promoting, and pursuing our national interests in the maritime domain. The Foundation's contribution to this strategic document underscores its profound understanding of maritime challenges uh, dedicated to shaping effective responses. Uh, there has been a substantial contribution of the NMF even towards uh, formalizing the Anti-Piracy uh, Act of 2022, which has been seldom recognized. and. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say that uh, the ongoing anti-piracy operations uh, being undertaken by us has really got a uh, shot in the arm because of this uh, legislation. You know, we have now deployed uh, three units there. They're almost off the coast of Somalia. And every single DAO fishing vessel or craft that is suspected is being boarded uh, anything which got a piracy trigger like a uh, high-speed OVM is being thrown overboard or confiscated, anyone, any vessel which has got uh, uh, weapons, obviously, all getting, you know, taken charge of. So, we are aggressively pursuing this because of this piece of national legislation which has been uh, uh, promulgated in 2022, December 2022, that has really strengthened us and uh, we are among... Uh, very few countries which have had a national legislation on uh, anti-piracy uh, uh, as an anti-piracy act. Uh, similarly, the IMSS also emphasizes Bharat's role as a third security partner in the region, as is evident from the affirmative action being undertaken, uh, even in the in protecting the merchant ships in again the anti-drone uh, uh, operations in the West and the uh, North Arabian Sea. Uh, similar to NMF, the VIF has a long and distinguished history of contributing to critical national security issues, the foundations of which were once again laid by Abdul Nayar as its first chairman. So it is uh, therefore a fitting tribute that Sri Gurumurthy of VIF delivers the memorial lecture today. Uh, and Admiral Nayar also played an interesting uh, uh, pivotal role in setting up of the ORFP Observer Research Foundation. Uh, 
So these three think tanks have earned national and international repute of being the leading voices on geopolitical and strategic affairs. The Raisina Dialogue, which is you know a very prominent uh, calendar event uh, steered by the ORF. The presence of VIF's chairman, Sri Guru Murthy, here today signifies a shared commitment to advancing Bharat's maritime interests and underscores the importance of synergy between think tanks towards fostering maritime consciousness. The uh, one aspect of it is maritime consciousness. Second is maritime thought. That first we need to uh, inculcate this uh, understanding and awareness of what the sea offers and what can what what it is all about, and our heritage and so on. And then is the maritime thought. Maritime thought is about how can we harness the sea for our betterment, and uh, the collaboration that I speak of uh, must be complemented by a concerted effort to foster this thought of maritime thinking throughout our nation. We need to cultivate a deeper understanding of the significance of the seas, not just as a source of trade, uh, but as a strategic domain impacting our security, economy, and environment. So this necessitates raising the maritime awareness and then enhancing consciousness in our youth, uh, encouraging maritime research, and promoting maritime-related careers. So as the only country in the world to have an ocean named after her, you know, we are endowed with a distinct maritime geography of about 50 million years now. It's an opportune moment today to remember and reaffirm the role of maritime power in her rise and relevance. It is the seas, the medium of culture, uh, connectivity, and commerce, which enabled prosperity in prehistoric Bharat, the Mauryas and the Gupta eras, right until the period of medieval Cholas, the Marakars, and the Marathas. So roughly a millennium ago, Cholas achieved what a superior maritime power is expected to establish, which is sea control. And the Chola ships con uh, conducted lucrative trade with kingdoms as far away as Indonesia and China. They not just looked east, but acted east. In fact, the Chola kingdom and its maritime endeavors exemplified the maritime virtue cycle that espoused the symbiotic relationship between maritime trade and naval strength, a defining attribute of contemporary maritime powers. We saw that happening with the uh, with the European powers, and then US, then China, and now I feel it is our turn. The Marekas daring guerrilla warfare, meanwhile, stood as, a, as early symbols of resistance against foreign domination. And the Marathas under Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj built a formidable fleet that not only protected Bharat's interests, but also disrupted the dominance of colonial trading companies, demonstrating the strategic and economic importance of the maritime power. So as Bharat once again shifts its gaze to the seas for spurring economic growth, I see the signs of an aspiring maritime power. So be it the key articulations of Saga and IPOI by your Honorable Prime Minister, be it the conduct of an open debate on maritime security at the UN by Bharat as the chair of UNSC, be it the NSA, uh, Sri Ajit Doval's assertion that maritime security has gained its rightful prominence in India's security discourse, as well as, as, well as international outreach with the setting up of the NMSC, or be it initiatives such as the impetus given to blue economy, or the promulgation of a maritime mission 2030, or I would say the recent hike in the Navy's share in defense budget to 19.71% the highest in the last two decades. So all these point to a maritime mindset of harnessing the seas for strategic, diplomatic, military, and economic gains towards national security and growth. So here again, Admiral Nair's vision of reinvigorating India's maritime primacy resonates strongly today. So his legacy lives on, not just in Bharti Nausena, but in every warp and weft of India's maritime Renaissance. His foresight has provided us platforms such as NMF and VAF, enabling maritime discourse and collaboration. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a collective responsibility now to build upon his legacy, foster maritime thinking, and ensure that India continues to ride the waves with unwavering zeal and elan. So, before I conclude, my compliments to Team NMF for the successful conduct of this milestone initiative. 
and I'm confident that today's lecture will invoke and inspire further discourse on maritime matters. Uh, we must remember to ensure Bharat's growth in this Kartavya call. We need to cultivate the clarion call of your, that is, Jalameva Asia, Balameva Tasya. Or one who controls the seas is all powerful, as articulated by Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. It's a maritime mantra that will serve us and our nation very well in times to come. So the uh, I feel this uh, the, the topic of rise of civiliz civilizational consciousness and civilizational nationalism is a very apt one. Uh, the navy itself is undergoing a transformation. Uh, be it Gulami Mansikta Se Mukti or Virasat Pegar. So uh, there is criticism uh, from many quarters, but we are transforming rapidly and at a scorching uh, pace. And uh, we want to keep in step with what is happening in our country. I mean, the you know, we are on the uh, harnessing the youth dividend. And we are we are going to remain a young nation till at least till 2070. So we want to be a fully Atmanurbar Navy by 2047, a postmodern Navy, as uh, Geoffrey Till uh, says in his book SIPA. That's what we want to achieve. And I think even 2047 is you know uh, is too far away. Uh, perhaps we will achieve this even earlier than that. A lot of effort is being given, and a lot of thrust is being put in. To ensure that we transform very fast in in our thought, be it in you know in every every aspect, the processes, procedures, the the platforms, the way we think, the way we fight, and that is what is the is the transformational uh, uh, effect uh, that we want to bring in to become a postmodern navy. So thank you, uh, Shano Varun, Jai Bharat. Thank you, sir. Our next segment is deeply poignant as we remember Vice Admiral K.K. Nair through the eyes of his daughter, Ms. Geeta Nair. Ma'am, you have the floor. Respected Admiral Hari Kumar, Admiral Dhawan, Admiral Karamveer Singh, Guru Murti Ji, Vice Admiral Johan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my brother Ashok and the Nair family, we are delighted to have you join us for the third annual Vice Admiral KK Nair lecture. We would like to thank the Indian Navy for its support and the NMF for conducting this lecture every year. This year, as has been mentioned, the lecture is special. It brings together the two organizations my father was the founding chairman of. These organizations truly represented what my father was passionate about and his work. My father's first love was India. It was his dream to see India achieve a preeminent global position, a direction we are now moving towards. His second love was the Indian Navy, and he firmly believed that for India to be recognized as a global leader, it was important to become a maritime power. In order to achieve these goals, in his view, there was a significant role for independent organizations, think tanks supported by quality research focused on nation building and long-term strategic thinking on key issues. He embedded his belief in his work and was a proud chairman of both these organizations, which are continuing to successfully focus on excellent work for the nation. Ashok and I are particularly delighted that Guru Murti Ji is the speaker today. My father knew Guru Murti Ji well, and they work together as well, and they have many similarities. Both of them committed nationalists, proud of their culture, religion, and tradition. This even at a time when it was not quite the fashion, and sometimes there was a price to be paid, which they did with an equanimity, as they were very firmly committed to their cause. They also shared a unique trait of always being on a continuous path of discovery and learning at any age or stage of their life. My father held Guru Murti Ji in the highest esteem. It was not just for his incredible intellect or list of significant academic or professional achievements. 
It was largely for his selfless work and commitment to the nation. I recall my father telling me that Gurumurthy Ji never wanted any position. And while it is unique to meet an individual who shuns power and position, what is even more unique in the world of PR and publicity is to find an individual who is focused only on his cause with no desire for personal gain or rep recognition. And for that, there was a similarity between my father and Guru Murthy Ji. Both of them embody the work of a Karimbir and the philosophy of Karam ki eja or Pal ki chana kar. My father measured the success of an individual by what they achieved for the country. And by that yardstick, I don't think there is a need for a title or a position to declare Guru Murthy Ji as one of the most successful individuals that my father believed in. As a nation, we would be stronger richer on many counts, prouder of our culture, and would have achieved even greater heights if we had more committed citizens like them. And for that reason, we are particularly honored and delighted to have Guru Murthy Ji as our speaker for the Vice Admiral KK Nair lecture today. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now it is with great anticipation that we await the highlight of today's program. We are privileged to have Sri Swami Nathan Gurumurthy, Chairman of the Vivekananda International Foundation, who will shed light on the theme Rise of Civilizational Consciousness and Civilizational Nationalism. May I now request, sir, to take the floor and enlighten us all. Admiral R. Hari Kumar. Chief of the Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Pratip, Pratip Chauhan, who set very high standards both in terms of delivery, language, phonetics, which is very difficult to excel. And I don't certainly hope to excel the phonetic part of it, maybe the idiom and grammar part of it I can. Admiral Karambir Singh and uh, Ashok Nair and Geeta Nair who are diligently pursuing the um, perpetuation of the memory and the things and the thoughts and the work for which uh, Nair stood. I must say it's a, an important, you know, many people inherit many things from the parents, but this what they have inherited is something for the good of the society and the country. See, today's topic is as I said, quite provocative, but I was trying to tell them it can be equally contemplative also. But before I go into the topic, I must also try and explain what is my relationship with Mr. Nair, which makes me stand before you. I have no other credential, perhaps, to match him. And... Uh, to be part of a, a, a lecture before this August audience. My credentials are that I started as his junior colleague in Vivekananda International Foundation, which was established by Mr. Ajit Doval and Mr. Nair for a different purpose. It was not one of those think tanks that they wanted to establish in Delhi. There are many. And it was established with a, with, a, with a purpose, with a goal, with an ideal, with a drive, which you will not see in any other think tank. One of the first things we decided to put in the trust deed of the Vivekananda International Foundation is that it will not accept any foreign donation. To give a basic Bharatiya trust to the very philosophy functioning and those who man the institution. We thought that this was an essential and the most difficult thing to put at a time when everybody was looking everywhere outside India, not only for ideas, but also for money. We could do it because we felt it was a national necessity and this nation had a global responsibility. It's not that this has been a nation which has been exclusive to itself. It had been from the beginning, for thousands of years, it only thought of the world and the good of the world. And we don't often remember 
that this civilization had an orientation which was denied to all other civilizations and that is why it has a durability which is also denied to all other civilizations as swami vekananda said if you want to look at the greco roman egyptian egyptian civilization you have to look at the broken monuments but here you can see some continuity somewhere about which i will relate to what the encyclopedia britannica says so the kind of intense public discourse public education and the normal understanding of the country that must have taken place post independence hasn't taken place it's a very unfortunate failure of both leadership as well as the continuity of the colonial model which we had adopted and inherited so admiral nair has been in a way my teacher this is te teacher student relationship and i was a newcomer to the strategic field i had the urge i had a missionary zeal but that is not adequate to be part of a, a strategic group which relates to the world which relates to everything in india and outside but they shaped me actually admiral nair and ajit doval shaped me and i cannot forget the way they initiated me they groomed me they made me study they made me look at things they made me part of them and that's why i am before you otherwise i have no qualification to stand before you i started off as a chartered accountant then became a journalist then became a political activist and of course i had a, a role in economics also but in none of these things i had any kind of specialization in fact one of the things i would like to emphasize before people who think in the in silo pattern in domain pattern is that super specialization has limited the pursuit of knowledge there is no comprehensive uh, helicopter view linking different domains and everybody is a specialist and nobody is a leader and you have to accept a specialist as a leader which the other specialization doesn't want to do so we need to have this is because basically americanization of knowledge in fact mr balbir punji is sitting here i was delivering a lecture before niti ayog <laughs> when she was sitting before me that day he told that uh, he took his wife to a doctor i surgeon and is it there are eight specialization in i treatment can you believe this and each person who specializes considers himself the expert and none of them will expect the ex, uh, 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 accept the other as the comprehensive i specialist this happens even in maritime field it happens within the army within the government in the field of economics in the field of sociology anthropology i find this super specialization is placing a huge limitation on the knowledge gathering pursuit of knowledge understanding of human life it is all fit into silos this is one of the objections which i am going to raise in the course of my speech i owe this lecture this very topic and its content to mr nair most people do not know he was a civilizational nationalist that is what drove him that is what made him part of the vekananda international foundation he had any amount of think tanks inviting him to lead but he took particular attention he took particular interest in vekananda international foundation because it was the think tank of his dream he used to tell me which think tank will have the guts to say that they won't receive foreign money when people were queuing up to give and there were many and when they said you know there was a within within couple of years of establishing as a think tank you know when this think tank was established it was inaugurated by mata amrutan this shook delhi this is indian civilization indian civilization is not army it is not generals it's it's something much higher so we wanted to emphasize that point and from that time onwards 
you will be surprised to know. Sajid Dole used to say it with pride. The three army chiefs in uniform came and attended programs in Vekananda International Foundation before 2014. Perhaps you know the significance of the date I mentioned. And more, he used to tell me that we have given no first use offer to Pakistan about a nuclear, in a nuclear attack. We will not attack first. If Pakistan attacked, what would be the collateral damage to India? The task was given to Vekananda International Foundation. You know why? Because we did not accept money from abroad. This is important for a country. That you that is Atmanirbharata. Atmanirbharata cannot be achieved if you are looking for a donation and issuing receipts to some foreign think tank. Many came. In fact, when we organized programs, they will be the first one to say we are willing to sponsor this. Somebody offered, I think, five crore donation. I said, we are not takers. Understand, this is Admiral Nair. So his high credentials as a maritime leader and a specialist, I need not have to go into because all of you know much more than me. But he was a highly respected strategic thinker. In fact, he was a leader of the strategic community. One of the qualities which made me feel more attracted to him, he says, I am also a man of strong views. He was also a man of strong views. But he knew how to deal with people of other views who had held strong views and still win their respect. You know, this is possible only for tall people. It's not possible for a tall specialist. A tall man is able to get the attention of the people without being adversarial. That quality is something which I am still trying to inherit, but I cannot say I have succeeded in it. He was a sought after leader of a strategic community, but I tell you, he had not only special love, and he felt that the Vekananda International Foundation were, was his chosen domain, implementing the civilizational dimensions of Indian strategic thinking, Indian culture, Indian statehood, the purpose of India in the context of the world. You see, there is nothing that the Indian thinkers expounded which is unconnected to the world. Everything was rooted in the overall interest of Ekam Sat Viprabhudavadanti. Let noble thought comes to, come to us from all sides. Sarve Jana Sukhino Bhavantu. Even you don't, these were all not yesterday's. It's not modern thoughts. These were all thousands of years back and into our DNA. And the consequence of it, I am going to tell you in a world which has nothing to do with these ideas, which is adversarial to these, all these ideas, hostile to all these ideas. How are we going to deal with this world? That is the civilizational challenge India has been facing, failing, succeeding, escaping. These are all the things I would like to bring to your notice. And the civilizational nationalism of India which is the core of the Vivekananda International Foundation, was the thing that bond and bound Admiral Nair and me. Of course, about his contribution, how he founded this National Maritime Foundation and all that, I need not have to say it was very well dealt with. Some of them so new to me. Of course, many things are new to me. This is also new to me. Today's topic, the rising civilizational consciousness and civilizational nationalism. As I said, it's not an abstract subject, which I will go into and explain further and try to convince you. It is equally concrete and contemplative. And more important, it has close nexus with the idea of national strategic narrative. I am not talking about national strategic 
national strategic uh, security strategy there is a difference between national security strategy and national security narrative national strategic narrative is a concept which has it is evolving for the last decade or so and i have not heard it in the indian discourse that is why i chose this topic that there is a link between civilizational consciousness and civilizational nationalism of india and national strategic narrative which i will try and explain before that i have to give you it's not that we are talking about uh, a geography of 2.4% of the total land area of the world and 18% of world's population we are talking about much more larger connect for us so i would like to begin with where the world stands today and where it stood and where it is moving in the context of the happenings today i am not getting into uh, specific likes ukraine or uh, whatever i would like to give a general perspective about how different people who have handled the world shaped the world are talking about the world post world war and cold war order is in icu today i don't think anyone has any doubt about it what we thought was permanent globalization permanent the western domination permanent all this has been shaken in the last two, two decades and it has happened before our very eyes newspapers are bringing it out headlines are proving it so the man who shaped the post cold war world war and cold war order henry kissinger said the world order will change forever this was his first comment after the covid uh, pandemic in after the ukraine war he said unless we do something immediately the world order will get restructured forever all this has no meaning the only thing is the present order is not going to last what it will be what shape it will take order means a leader there is not going to be any leader according to the european union far side studies institute by 2030 there will be no hegemonic world power at all middle powers are rising their own power their own position their own geographies their own assets their own competence are enabling them to play a role which was denied to them what that will do to the world is a different thing middle powers are rising and india's emergence as a strategic power and a geopolitical influencer has been phenomenal in the last decade of course it has been rising since we decided to play the global game indians never knew the will to power we all thought to keep the power is the most uh, difficult thing to do yes it is but in a world of power you have to play the power game i don't know how many of you recalled that uh, when we exploded the poker and atom bomb what bill clinton said i very well remember <laughs> i read it in the newspaper at that time it is as clear as i am seeing this boat to be he said a land of buddha and gandhi has done this we were always a land of buddha and gandhi how did you treat us the world never treated india with respect till india exploded the poker and atom bomb it cost us in fact i was part of the discussions of government at that time the entire finance ministry official said this government has ruined india not an easy decision to take strategically the turning point the west got the announcement that they have changed india and from that time onwards you are seeing how they are engaging india they engaged india because of the atom bomb in the hands if china did not have atom bomb in 1965 with the kind of poverty and hunger in which they were steeped in with 30 million chinese dying 
in between 1957 and 1960, the news of which came out only in 1978. Why did they engage China? It's because it had power in its hands. It's a world of power, the will to power. India learned quite late. Why? There was always a civilizational conflict in India between having power and how to use it, handle it properly. This Dharam Sankat has been agitating India not today. From the time of Kautilya, I will go to it later. I want to highlight why it is important for us to understand the rise of civilizational consciousness all over the world and what is Indian civilization nationalism in the context of what the world is today. And in this, one thing is definite, which most of the strategic thinkers with whom I move agree, that the world today is not going to be the linear extension of today to tomorrow. A very different world is emerging. The most important shift is from a free world we are moving into a world of deep fakes. You can understand the kind of confusion, chaos. In fact, the man who uh, uh, found the artificial intelligence, he says, I have found something it is going to, we don't know what it is going to do to the world. And you have to run governments. You have to manage public opinion. We don't know whether the picture that is appearing in as what you are doing is true. You may be seen as shaking hands with Daud Ibrahim. It may be published in the newspaper. And it will be believed, at least for the first two days. And you will be only defending for the next four days, you are not that person. This is the danger to which nations are being exposed, people are being exposed, system is being exposed. We have to find out Answer for the answers for all this. It cannot be technological. This calls for a national strategic narrative. And this is what two uh, State Department officials, without putting their name, wrote a paper in 2011. And that was carried by the Wilson Center. And I am going to quote from that report. There are two situations in which they were thinking it is necessary for America. One, there is declinism taking place in American power. After 2008, as someone who has intense understanding and pursuit of economics, American power has eroded enormously. It is not as much as understood as it is perceived. Everybody perceives it, but nobody says. Because if you say that, what little survives as faith in the subject of economics will collapse. So we have to keep that subject of economics surviving. I'm not going to get into greater detail than this, but you must understand it is not economic crisis, it is economics in crisis. But still we are looking at the same book. So there is a huge problem. And where it will lead to, at what point another collapse like this taking place, where the world will be, the financial system will be, the center of gravity will be, we don't know. So they write, this is the Anne Mary Slaughter, Director of Policy Planning, U.S. Department of State. She has written a covering note for that paper. It was written the name of one Mr. Y. She writes, United States needs a national strategic narrative. We have a national security strategy, which sets forth four core national interests and outlines a number of dimensions of an overarching strategy to advance those interests in the 20th century. The next sentence is very important. But this document is uh, written by specialists for specialists. It doesn't answer the fundamental question that more and more Americans are asking. 
what is the united states going in the world where is the united states going in the world how can we get there etc the next sentence is very very important and connects me to the topic we need a story note the word a story with a beginning middle and projected happy ending that will trans transcend our political divisions orient us as a nation give us both common direction and confidence and commitment to get to our destination all these are as abstract as my topic today a narrative is a story a national strategic narrative must be a story that americans can understand and identify within their own lives a national story has always been the most important part is what i am going to read to you about the american dharm sankat america's national stories has always seesawed between exceptionalism and universalism we have exactly the same problem which i will relate to you the exceptional is about america is that we are a free nation we are this we are individual rights human rights gender rights this free market liberal democracy these are all the exceptionalism of america but the universalism of america doesn't reflect any of these things they identify with all rogue nations they support all rogue nations they arm all rogue nations paper says so it says there is a contradiction between your universalism and exceptionalism we have to align it you can no more show your gun and control the world and the world of information which you are facing is a different world this is what that paper says but the important point is that you need a narrative to unify the american mind present america to the world that this is america you know this happened in 1980 when joseph nye he invented that he, he innovated the idea of uh, soft power and said america should not be branded by warships it should be branded by coca cola pepsi cola um, mickey mouse i mean this is a very very uh, what i can say very ordinary way of presenting but that is how america became a power it by selling coca cola it conquered the world by presenting mickey mouse it bamboozled the world but these are not going to be a long term project it could work for one month two month one decade two decade at least he proposed an alternative to the rogue stage of america now here the proposal is that you have to live by your own profession as this can you do it that was the challenge before america and the challenge continues even today between exceptionalism and universalism we do not want to be the sole superpower that billions people around the world have learned to hate from fear for our military might we seek instead to be the nation that other nations listen to rely on and emulate out of respect and admiration the substance i want to present before you that the topic i have taken is that a national strategic narrative for india is needed but what can be that narrative as i said national strategic narrative is different from national security strategy which is more systematic is policy oriented but national strategic narrative is something much larger there is philosophy in it there is lifestyle in it there is a relationship in it and there is a restraint in it these are all the things which we have to factor in when we are talking about the civilizational nationalism in india and we could we can talk about it we could not talk about it maybe two decades before why because civilizational consciousness was kept suppressed by two ruling ideologies of the world 
both the free market as well as communism both hated civilization you know what happened in china in 1965 they wanted to wipe out the remnants of everything of the past and they carried on a war against it every book every statue every temple every memorial was put out but from that china which hated its past which hated confucius it burnt his books it threw his pictures from that communist china a confucian china is emerging today this happened as at the turn of the 20th century and today xi jinping addressing the centenary of the communist movement he said we have a 5000 year civilization which will guide us not only now forever right where did you find the civilization because the dna of china is basically confucian it is not communist this could not be suppressed in fact admiral nair told me something stunning when we were discussing china he said the man who first saw the rise of confucian china you will be surprised mr gurumurthy it is the rss chief ms golwalkar in 1972 a question was put to him what do you think will be china in one sense it is there in his book a confucian china will emerge out of the communist china with its empire building instincts intact this is the power of civilization civilization is dna it is inherent in our conduct in our thought in our attitudes in our relationships you may suppress it as we suppress for 70 years so when it comes see elsewhere it may come as something like a volcano as a revolution in india never india will never have a revolution in fact 1990s i used to discuss with many economists why india did not become communist and it had so much poverty 70% poverty this that and the other so i used to tell them in india <laughs> 75% of the people are self employed the self employed is his own worker and his own master <laughs> where will he find the place for proletarian uh, movement that is what we regard as atmanirbharta even today more than 2/3 of indians are entrepreneurs this is proven by the Uh, economics uh, economic survey uh, which is taken every 10 years i am not talking about the annual economic survey we just put it out so we have a very different society we have a very different mind we have a very different philosophy we have also an exceptionalism we have also universalism our especially exceptionalism and universalism are one and the same vasudeva kutumbakam this is our exceptionalism but this is our universalism also we don't practice something outside which we don't practice inside the contradiction is in america their exceptionalism conflicts with their universalism but our exceptionalism and universalism are aligned they have problem because of the conflict we have problem because both are one and the same because we treat even our enemies we have they say about billion people who have intruded into india it is because vasudeva kutumbakam atithi devo bhava you don't ignore anybody everybody the very noble thoughts but clearly contradicts the idea of national security today it is not that these national security issues have come because of politics because of political parties it has come because of our own civilizational upbringing 
So this narrative, how important it is, I have to emphasize where we have set the world, where, where the world was and where we were set in it, and where that world has moved and where we are going to be set in it is important. You know, many people have not read, in those days when the United Nations was considered to be a very strong body, today it is nothing, it is a debating club. In 1951, the United Nations, it gathered all the experts and came out with measures for the development of underdeveloped countries, which was mandated to all the countries of the world, which was purely based on the Western understanding of themselves, and they wanted to shape the world according to that understanding. That is called anthropology of modernity. Of course, those who are students of anthropology will understand what I am saying. What it says is important. There is a sense in which rapid economic progress is impossible without painful readjustments. Ancient philosophies have to be scrapped old social institutions have to disintegrate. Bonds of caste, creed, and race have to burst. And large number of persons who cannot keep up with progress have to have the expectations of comfortable life frustrated. Very few communities are willing to pay this price. This was the basis on which our education system, our policies, our planning commission, our public discourse, our media, Began saying, unless you cease to be what you are, you can never develop. This was our education. You can never develop so long as what you are. And you continue to be. This was the one size fit all model into which they tramped the world. And it became more pronounced and even more voluntarily accepted when globalization came. This was the Western model, what they call as the liberal world order. I'm not criticizing any of these things. I'm only commenting. My tone may look criticism, but what I am presenting is purely facts. So when this is called the one size fit all model, which became more voluntarily accepted because the competitor had disappeared. Lester Thoreau wrote in 1990 in his book, Head to Head, he said the problem of capitalism is that it needed a competitor for its efficiency. The competitor had disappeared, so its efficiency will disappear. This is true of not only economics, this is true of politics also, because they did not have competitor. They thought they could ram through the world. They began expanding NATO, they began, this. you see the consequences that is happening today. So, this one-size-fit-all model made them declare arrogantly that the West has won against the rest forever. It is best for the rest to follow the West. This is what Francis Fukuyama wrote in his book, The End of History and the Lost Man. He said, all conflicts have ended. You can close down the history departments today. The West has won. I mean, how foolish to put in a common man's language and how unwise it is to put in your language for someone to say that uh, all conflicts have disappeared. Huntington came out with this protest. Gentlemen, I think you are... And the way he summarized the whole thing in his paper, how this reality was being suppressed and something was being projected to mislead the world, he said he, he just to take how the Olympics was decided to be held in Australia, not in Beijing. All the Christian nations voted for Australia. All the non-Christian nations voted for China. See, this is the world. You understand it. It's not policy. There is a civilizational drive. Don't forget it. He was abused. All the liberals pounced on him. But 9-11 attack took place, <laughs> and Tinton came alive. Liberalism is, at best, elitism. It doesn't go, that is what that uh, National Strategic Narrative paper says, that it is 
a policy of experts for experts. It is not policy for the ordinary people. Ordinary people live their own life. They are, they are not educated in Harvard. They are not educated in uh, big institutions. They don't deliver good speeches in English. But they live their life. And they are 99.999% of the world. It's true of America also. That is why they say we want a narrative which the ordinary American will understand. The ordinary American is the real American. And not think tanks. The think tanks have to deal with, understand, expound, express the ordinary man. This is the function of the think tank. This top-down knowledge making, the specialization, this has killed the entire process of knowledge creation as well as knowledge distribution. The civilizational consciousness of India rose in the 21st century so far, so powerfully. As I said, the communist China began declaring itself as Confucian China. And parallelly, there has been a rise of civilizational consciousness in India also. Like of which, in a democracy, in a peaceful manner, shift of the mind, that we have to move, we have to look at the past for our inspiration is something which we have now undeniably begun accepting. Previously, it was not so. Anything of the past is wrong. You know, when I was speaking to some scholars of history, they used to say, I mean, this is not this is out, something out of the way, but something very relevant, I have to say here. But how the super specialization has killed the pursuit of knowledge. You know, Vedas were regarded as imaginary because the river Saraswati mentioned there did not exist. So if they mentioned a river that did not exist, the people who spoke about it were only imagining. But now, there is a huge scientific data which proves that river Saraswati indeed flew, uh, was flowing. And now the water has been located in different places. The same water as in Himalayas is going right up to Ran of Kutch. And satellite imagery has shown that there has been a shift of water into Sutlej and Yamuna. And that is how Saraswati dried up. That means Saraswati was real. And so those who wrote in the Vedas about Saraswati, they were talking about something real. They were not poets. They were not imaginary. Next most important evidence I'll tell you. Seven noble laureates have said, the answers to the questions raised by the quantum mechanics, you can find only in Vedas and Upanishads. So Vedas and Upanishads were not poems. There was scientific knowledge in it. The scientists say so. So ask the historians, have we ever factored these two facts into the history of India, the origin of India? An Indus Valley civilization. How continuous it is. It is not taught anywhere. It is Dravidian. It is an Aryan. It has nothing to do with the Vedic civilization. Actually, Ayravata Mahadevan, who is perhaps the greatest epigraphist, I had worked with him. In fact, in 1978, when he was looking at the Rigveda and the Indus Valley seals, he said, Guru, I am shocked that the Rigveda description of the Somapana Yajna is in Indus Valley seals. And he wrote a paper in 1983. He was abused for that. But now the whole world accepts that there is a connect between Indus Valley civilization and Vedic civilization. Now, this is what the Encyclopedia Britannica says about Indus Valley civilization and its continuity till today. It's not me. In India, if such a thing is taught, they will give a color to this particular text. While the Indus or Harappan civilization may be considered, the culmination of a long process of indigenous, long process indigenous to Indus Valley. This is important because many people relate it to Babylonian and Egyptian civilization. But this author is an Australian. He's a leftist writer. He says, indigenous to Indus Valley, a number of parallels exist between the developments on the Indus River 
and the rise of civilization in Mesopotamia. Isn't there a parallel? It is striking to compare Indus with this better known and more fully documented region and to see how closely the two coincide with respect to the emergence of cities and of such major concomitants of civilization as writing, standardized weights, measures, and monumental architecture. Yet nearly all the earlier writers have sensed the Indianness of this civilization, and even when they were largely unable to articulate it. Historian V. Gordon Child is an Australian. He is regarded as a leftist. He says, India confronts Egypt and Babylonia by the third millennium with a thoroughly individual and independent civilization of her own. Technically, the peer of the rest. And plainly, it is deeply rooted in the Indian soil. Indus civilization represents a very perfect adjustment of human life to a specific environment. And it has endured. And it is already specifically Indian and forms the base of the modern Indian culture. New light on most Asian East. 4th edition, 1952. It has still not got into your textbooks, textbooks. The force of child's words, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. The force of child's words can be appreciated even without examination of industrial script. Found on the seals, the attention paid to the domestic bathrooms, the drains, the great bath at Monjadaro, which is regarded as your, your, uh, mm, that is the starting point of the Kumbh Mela, according to many. Pay to the uh, great bath at Mojadaro can be compared to the elements of later Indian civilization. The bullock carts with framed canopy called rikas, the boats, are little changed even to this day. The absence of pin and love of bangles and of elaborate nose ornaments are peculiarly South Indian, uh, South Asian. The religion of Indus is also replete with suggestions of traits known from later India. The significance of the bull, the tiger, the elephant, the composite animals, the seated yogi or the seal, yoga, yogi god of the seals, three spirits and the objects resembling Shiva of later times. These are all suggesting enduring forms of later Indian civilization. This continuity doesn't exist anywhere. And till today it is continuous. And it is not only continuous in terms of external appearances, there is continuity in terms of internalized thoughts. That is what we suffer from. And we are a non-conflicting civilization. That is, every civilization has a conflicting element. In fact, every civilization means conflict. India is the only civilization, our civilization, did not have an adversarial enemy. We did not have a theological enemy. We have nobody to fight. In fact, the I think the army must introduce this particular book for everybody. The Hindu Rules of War by V. R. Ramchandra Dikshit. It's one of the finest books written. It has been forgotten. It has been discovered through internet and it is available. And it says in the Vedas, if somebody says, if somebody dropped the weapon in the battlefield, is a non-combatant. Anyone injured is a patient. Anyone who is not in the battlefield is a non-combatant. Tell me, the West realized it only in 1897 at the Hague. The distinction between combatants and non-combatants. And this continued. In Mahabharata, we are told that the Pandavas and Kauravas used to have a drink after the war was over. The next day, they began fighting with each other. Is it possible? In the 17th century, in the history of Kerala by Padmanabha Manan, he quotes White Way, who wrote on how the Portuguese and the Zamuri kings fought. The Zamuri king writes a letter to the Portuguese. Gentlemen, we don't know how you wage wars. We wage wars like this. We beat the drum in the morning, say we are ready for war. But we won't attack you till you also. In the evening, if you beat the drum, even if you are waging the war, we will stop. Because 
we stop the war when the enemy is not prepared for the war we will not attack you without <laughs> and he said no no the people are there agricultural operations are going there there is a huge playground there on both sides there is water you perch your army on one side we perch our army on the other side and the portuguese is asking is he asking for war or sports and the zamori kings war model is described by white way that the two kings will be fighting but the army will be perched together they will be exchanging their rations they will be talking to each other at the beat of the drum they will separate and begin hitting each other this is the continuance of the dna the book is called the history of kerala by padmanabha manan these are all the things which stood against us our entire strategic culture collapsed in the third on the 30th march 2013 the economist magazine wrote does india have a strategic culture we had a strategic culture but that strategic culture was destroyed with that i will now almost come to the last part of my speech this information i got not in the government of india website not in any textbooks you will be amazed i got it from the pakistan government's website what i am going to tell you this is in the history and culture of pakistan by hamid one more name is there i am missing it mr dol knows that name he is his friend he they write about the history and culture of pakistan you must read it in that the only claim that pakistan makes as the contribution of islam is the architecture and food nothing else even the national dress of pakistan was of the kushana period this is so. this is our forefathers for takshaka the snake king pakistan government website takshashila university was the greatest university world over people used to come and get educated there chandragupta maurya got educated there ashoka got educated there and you know who was the teacher the teacher was kautilya the most famous exponent of strategic thinking at that time and the important point that the pakistan government website makes is the interaction between kautilya and alexander kautilya asks alexander how are you waging wars like this we are not used to this war we don't just wage a war because you have an army you have to give notice to the other side and the other side may well they may not wage a war that is why we are ramchandra dishes were declared ashoka's kalinga war was an adharmic war it was without notice on a smaller kingdom he crushed it and killed 100000 people this is the indian model so alexander said who are you to ask we will do whatever you want this is something new for india for kautilya for our civilization so kautilya ran so fast alexander ordered his arrest he came quietly sat in the forest and said we have a very different enemy very different idea very different world and that is how he wrote the arthashastra we need a state we need a standing army we need great resources for that and he shifted the strategic thinking of india that you must win a virtuous war dharmic war even if you have a war if you win you must make the defeated king king again this was the kind of noble ideas but kautilya said don't do that if you win a war you acquire the territory build your empire that is why india could build empire till kushanas till the 9th century in the 4th century this is where the strategic thinking of india failed one banabatta wrote a book in which he said this kautilya is an adharmi he preaches adharma you know what is the result the entire arthashastra books all over india were burnt only one copy survived in tanjore that was handed over to mysore maharaja library in 1909 translated into english in 1913 that is what we call as arthashastra today the indian mind was always against war 
against any kind of blood shock. This is revealed by the fact that Professor Ramal, who studied the massive killings that took place all over the world for 2,500 years, he said 1.2 billion people were killed in human action against humans. And he said that till the 13th century, there was no mass killing in India except Emperor Ashoka's war in Kalinga. How is it that when the world, 1.2 billion people he has listed where, how the wars took place, killings took place. One geography which was absent was India. Why? Because we practiced our universalist values, exceptional values, without differentiating. That is why we invited this kind of uh, invasions. And the man who countered it was Chhatrapati Shivaji. He changed the rules of war to suit the enemy strategy. You know how he produced the results. So the Indian strategic thinking has to be studied in the historical perspective of how our exceptionalism has to be aligned to the global universalism and not your universalism. And we need to factor in the enemy. Adversary taught us how to shape our state attitudes. That is what Kautilya wrote, which was destroyed by Barnabatta and was reinstated by Shivaji. This entire public discourse is missing these very important links and elements in the Indian civilizational rise. We have to bring all this. And when we talk about civilizational nationalism, we must focus on how our exceptionalism being treated as our universalism outside has brought enormous national security risk for us. And we have to refashion our without losing the essence of our exceptionalism, how we bring national security narrative, how a national security narrative in India has to link with the idea of Indian civilizational consciousness, Indian uh, civilization nationalism is for all of us to work out. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was, as we had all expected, an address to remember. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we bring this wonderfully touching yet inspirational afternoon to a close, please join me in thanking Sri Swami Nathan Guru Murthy. Today's deliberations have encapsulated the essence and spirit of camaraderie that binds us all. Once again, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each one of you for gracing this event with your presence. May the insights gained today inspire us to chart a course towards a brighter maritime future. With that, we will now adjourn for a celebratory lunch at the Convergence Zone, Varithi. I kindly request everyone to proceed to the lunch venue. Team NMF will be happy to escort and direct you to the venue. Thank you. <laughs>